Good morning, Zion. I am so grateful you're joining us online today. And you could see it's a little bit different, crispier video, crispier audio. You're seeing me in a different place. Just want to give you a heads up of what to expect for today. We'll have our live stream of our service, and you can follow along if you text uh, Z online, all one word, to 97,000, and you will get the whole service to follow right along. In the meantime, please drop a hello in the chat. Love to see who's on today. And you'll see me come on back up real quick, real soon. Peace. Good morning, Zion. I just want to welcome you guys here. Grab a seat, come on front, and we'll just get started real soon. So if you already have your bagels, just bring that real quick along with you into the front. And for online, hello again. Love for you to join us. My name is Winnie. I'm your online host for today. And to get us started, we have our Sunday service sheets, whether you can text it or on your sheets in the seats. So you can grab that right along. And I'll invite you, if you could stand with me, we're gonna do our opening scripture where I'll read the unbolded and I'll invite you to read the bolded to start us off today in a time of worship. Psalm 146, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Put not your trust in princes. Blessed is he whom, whose help is the God of Jacob, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who executes justice for the oppressed. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. All right. Go for it. Father, we just invite your presence, God. 
We pray that you would have your way today, Father, that every song sung, every word spoken, God, would bring glory to your name. God, we, we lay down everything, God, and we fix our eyes on you this morning. Let you be high and lifted up above everything and above all, Father. We fix our attention and we bless your name, Father. We bless your name. We bless your holy name. Even before we sing, would you just begin to let out your praise to him. Tell him how much you love him. Oh, we adore you, Father. We bless you. You're worthy. You're holy. We worship you, Father. We don't take this for granted, God. Another opportunity to be in your presence, to gather with one another, to stand in awe of you, oh God. So God, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your faithfulness, God. Our hearts and our souls sing a new song unto you this morning. Great is your faithfulness, God. New mercies we see every morning. Every morning, God. We bless your holy name. Come on, whether you're watching online, whether you're in the room, begin to fill your homes, begin to fill the atmosphere with his presence, with your praise. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. You are high and lifted up. God, we're here for none but you. Only you, Jesus. Only you, God. We worship. We sing to an audience of one. This is about you. It's always been about you. And it will always be about you, Father. So come and have your way. Have your way. Have your way today, God. Have your way, Jesus. We invite you here. We invite you here. We invite you here. Fill the room. Fill the room. Fill the room. Oh, fill the room. Fill the room. Fill the room, Jesus. Fill the room, Jesus. Oh, you're 
keeper of our hearts, Lord. can never earn it so we thank you Jesus you've given it freely and you're washing over us right now your loving kindness is washing over
response to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to we surrender and I will make room for you you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you, to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up 
off the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better One more time And shake off the ground of all my tradition just the voices. make room for you, Holy Spirit, to move as you want in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we invite you, have your way, transform, renew, change, and mold us, God, to a better image bearer of you, that it would be said of us as it was said of the disciples, God, that when they heard them speak, they knew that they had been with Jesus. God, that as we carry ourselves and as we walk on this earth, that when others look at our lifestyle, when they look at our lives, when they look at our joy and our peace, that they would know that we have been with Jesus. Allow us, God, to make room in our lives that we would not fit you into a tightly packed schedule, but our schedules would revolve around the one true and only holy God. Work in us today, Father. Let your Holy Spirit come in a deeper, powerful way in our hearts. Sanctify us. Help us to learn what it means that the righteous shall live by faith. Father, we worship and we praise your name. Lord, and we invite you do your work in our, in our lives. Do your work in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people say, amen, amen, amen. Why don't you give God praise for a moment? Can you all turn to somebody and say hello? So before we get started, I just want to celebrate. We have Z Kids for the first time today in person. Woo! So if you have a child and you want to bring them, John over there, one of our elders in the back is raising his hand. You can bring them over to John and he will lead them into the room. Miss Diane is our Z Kids director who has started. We celebrated her coming on last week. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty pumped about that. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Uh, you made it through the marathon. Good job, everybody. Give yourselves a, a clap. 
For those of you online, don't clap for yourselves. It's okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm excited for today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Justin. I'm the pastor here at Zion. Uh, and I just want to celebrate a couple of things that happened this week that are worth celebrating. Uh, first off, any women that can't, are here now came to the women's breakfast yesterday? Awesome, nice. I heard some really good things about that, ladies. I'm glad. We had a bunch of our women get together at Felicia and Ray's house yesterday and get to hang out, uh, enjoy each other's company. And uh, it's important that as we grow as a church and get to know, uh, that we get to know each other as the people of God. And as um, we get to do that, Outside of Sunday, Sunday is our anchor. It is not the place where we really become family with other people. Uh, we had our anger management class start on Wednesday night. Clark uh, taught that. I heard it was absolutely incredible from several people who went. Uh, so that was awesome. Our Zion Academy is in full swing. We had our crypto class on Monday. There was a great group of people that came out to learn about crypto. And I think it's just continually important that we learn how to steward all the things that God has given us, whether it's our finances, our emotions, our time, all these things are important. Um, and the last celebration, which I already said, is our first uh, day of Z Kids in person in two years. That is crazy. Uh, so praise God for that. Um, we are going to be jumping into Habakkuk today. We're in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 to 20. We're going to be talking about God's justice. God's justice. You should have the passage uh, with you in the sheet that was on your chair when you walked in. We're not actually going to read the whole thing to start off. So I'm going to be reading this passage throughout, and I'll point you to it when we're going to get there. But the, where Habakkuk, if you've been tracking with us uh, so far, um, is Habakkuk has been complaining to God, has been angry with God, and God keeps on throwing him curveball answers that he is unexpected, unexpected to say and to be doing and to be hearing. Uh, and this is, you know, the, the first complaint Habakkuk says is, my people are unjust and they are terrible. The justice goes forth, but it's not real justice. You're, God, how can you allow your people to get to this state? And then God says, and, and, and Habakkuk says, when are you going to do something about this? And then Habakkuk, uh, God responds to him and says, oh, I'm doing something. And it's amazing. You're not even going to be able to believe it. And what happens after that? Um, God was right. Habakkuk could not believe it because God said that he was sending the Babylonians or the Chaldeans to come and judge Israel. Now, the Babylonians are, if you read history, one of the worst empires, the Neo-Babylonian Empire. If you're familiar with scripture, this is the empire that Nebuchadnezzar uh, led and that, you know, you have Daniel, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of these famous, you know, being thrown into the furnace, uh, Daniel in the lion's dead, these kind of things. That all happens under the Babylonian rule. And so Habakkuk is like, what do you mean you're sending even worse people then Israel, these unrighteous, uncircumcised people to come and judge your people. And at the end of, of this, Habakkuk says, you know, I'm going to wait for you to respond. Is this going to go on forever? Uh, and then God's response was last week. We started it and we're continuing it this week. God says, the righteous shall live by faith. Yes, the Babylonians are worse. The righteous shall live by faith. But then what we get into today is God's judgment, God's judgment towards the Babylonians. You know, I was thinking about, as I, I was reflecting on the scripture and kind of thinking about today's context, we don't have a lot of nation states that rise and fall like we did in ancient times where you have power struggles constantly, one empire or one nation, uh, uh, you know, conquering another tribe or another people. But what we do have today, which is really modern day warfare, is uh, corporate. 
corporate companies, corporate takeovers. Uh, when you look, think of expansion, you think of getting into new territory, going into these new places. I think of corporations all over the world, whether a capitalistic society or Marxist society, whether you're in China, Russia, or United States, you have the same principles at work that are happening here. Uh, and a lot of the times, companies that rise to the top are the most corrupt, and there are many of us even here that have asked, like, why, why do we allow, why, God, why do you allow uh, these people these, to get into powerful places or these companies uh, that let's say, you know, one company we all love, like Apple, that has been known to use slave labor overseas to achieve, you know, the iPhone and all the things that we love about Apple. Or you look at Amazon and, you know, if you just search Amazon and corporate culture and you'll get, you know, dozens and dozens of pages of corporate abuse and all of the things that they do. Um, why is it that God allows these things? You know, this is a very similar question that, Habakkuk was asking about Babylon when God said he was going to use Babylon. Why is it, it? It doesn't make sense. And then we look at the prosperous, and if you look at our culture today, what do we do as a people? We celebrate the achievements of these great men like Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk, but when you look at their lives, you see destruction left behind them. You look at broken relationships. You look at people that have when you look at the character of God and how God calls us to live, we are not supposed to emulate that, but yet as a society, and even as Christians, many times we, we, we look at those people and think they, that is, man, that is good. And so on one side, we have warped views of God's blessing and we look at a person like Jeff Bezos and we think, I want to be like that because God's blessing is material, it's worldly goods. On the other end, we see the corruption and we see the scheming and we see the oppression that causes companies and people to rise to this level of power and we say, God, how could you allow this? And so one end, we have a very warped view of what it means to walk righteously and faithfully to God and on the other end, we are disillusioned with this world and we say there is no point. Will God allow this to go on forever? Where is justice and will it ever come? That's how Habakkuk ended his last complaint to God is he says, how long will this go on? Will it go on forever? In chapter one, verse 17. I think this is a feeling we can all relate to. There may be a family situation that you've gone through where you know, I, I think of constantly there, one of the scenarios that I hear of is bad divorces. And what happens in a bad divorce many times and uh, what's actually the most unhealthy for the child uh, if there's children in a divorce is to speak poorly of the uh, other partner. That, uh, so when parents try to make their children choose sides or they speak poorly, even if you have been done wrong, as a little side note, by someone that you have divorced or used to be your partner, never speak poorly about them in front of your children. That will mess up your child and cause more trauma uh, than trying to get your child on their side. It actually, the healthiest thing for both kids is equal time uh, with equal partners, whether you like them or not. Uh, obviously, unless there's you know extenuating circumstances like uh, drug or alcohol abuse and things like that. But we, we may have been in a family situation where God, why is it that this person is getting away with this? You know, another time I see this constantly is when a family member dies and they leave their will and then there's just chaos in the family. Uh, you know, if you ever talk to a family lawyer, they will have stories for days of how uh, wills just destroy family. And, and if you talk to every single sibling or person that was left, they, they should have gotten this and they were unjustly done. Or if we look at a schooling situation where, you know, what, when, if we're in grade school, you're a high school student, college student, where somebody is doing something completely wrong, let's say they're cheating and they're getting better grades from you, they're being promoted, they are, 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 are getting that honor roll system, they're getting on the dean's list, and you think, man, I am working hard, and this person is cheating, they've never been caught, and they are getting all the honorifics, they are getting all of the quote-unquote blessings in life. Or maybe we have this feeling of disillusionment because we look at the global world or domestically in the U.S., and we have concern around whatever type of politics, whether it be abortion or social justice or 
anything like that. I love New York. This is just great. This is, there's no other better way to preach in New York than with someone honking behind you. Um, right? And, and the disillusionment begins to set in. God, how could you preside over this earth? Do you not look around just like I see? How could you do nothing when all of these corrupt, whether peoples, nations, companies, are doing what they want, when they want, and there seems to be absolutely no consequence? We can easily relate to Habakkuk here as he is talking to God about how Crazy, he thinks it is, that Babylon, of all people, is going to rise and that it's God's doing and that God will use them to judge Israel, God's own people. C'est la vie, like, what is the point? So today, I hope the weight of God's justice and how nothing escapes him will be felt and understood So let's read verse six, chapter two, verse six. This is God speaking to Habakkuk. He says, shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, we're gonna stop there. So remember, this is the second part of what God is talking about. And so last week we heard from John and God is saying, he says in verse six, shall not all these, what is all of these? It is pride, wine, greed, hurry, and collecting what is not yours. Let's read verses four and five to give us some context. God says, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith or by faithfulness towards God. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects all his, as his own, all peoples. So all of the things, God says, shall not all of these things come and take their taunt against Babylon. All of these things will be the downfall of Babylon. Today's passage is so remarkable because it is actually a, a song, a song of taunt to the oppressor that God, or a poem or a song that God gives to Habakkuk to share against Babylon. This is, this is like a battle rap going on, basically, where if you ever watch a battle rap, some of those things are crazy intense, and the point of a battle rap is to publicly shame the person you are rapping with. And so if you watch some good battles that have happened, there's some old ones on YouTube that were just like mind-blowing, and you watch them, you feel like cringe for the other person, what's happening, uh, of what is being saying. I, I don't want to spoil next week, but Habakkuk has a, a very uh, a similar response to that because what God is about to do is he is about saying, I'm going to publicly taunt and shame Babylon. And this taunt that is giving this song that you are going to sing, that I am going to give you, is going to share the mighty downfall of this people. And so God gives five woes. One one theologian put it this way, that these are mocking songs intended to taunt the oppressor from God. And so God gives five woes that are going to come upon Babylon. And this is the taunt that that he publicly shares that Babylon will publicly go through. So the first woe is in the second part of verse six. It says, woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble, then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations and all the remnant of the people shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. So what was Babylon doing here? They were rapidly conquering other nations. The Assyria, we talked about that, uh, we didn't. Assyria, I was preaching in Staten Island last week and I gotta get used to this whole thing of, I didn't preach this to Brooklyn last week. Um, But the Assyrian Empire had come to power and they were at their peak. 
and power, and they had some civil wars. After their peak, 20 years later, Babylon swept through and took over the entire empire, plus other empires like Judea and things like that. And so just to, to give you a reference of how this was God, you know, Rome, by the time they started having their first civil wars, which was about 30, 30 to 40 years before Caesar, their empire was at its peak and it lasted still hundreds of years after that. Assyria, after their peak and they started to have their first civil wars, when you're a, a huge empire in the ancient world and you have conquered everybody that threatens you, you now start to devour each other. There's no one else to conquer, but now you just, you conquer each other so you can be at the top of the pedestal. And so this started to happen to Assyria and Babylon comes in and sweeps and takes them over and then begins to take over the surrounding region. So Babylon was rapidly conquering cities, nations, and empires, heaping up other people's possessions, what was not their own. And then what they would do is when they would come in and take over another nation or another empire, well, they would make them their vassal state, which was you can rule yourself, but you are going to give us every year a pledge. You are going to give us money every single year. And that's going to be in perpetuity because we are now your overlords. Everything that we did not work for, we are going to take from you. And what they would do is they would put on these steep, um, these steep debts on them so that what? so that they can keep the nation poor, so that they did not have to worry about that nation rising up against them. And what they would do, they would take these things and they would heap them up for themselves. And so God gives them the judgment. Because they have plundered, they will be plundered. Because they have gone to all these nations, because they have plundered and indiscriminately taken what was not theirs, they have created for themselves piles of gold and wealth and, and have taken what did not belong to them, the judgment that God says is what you have done to others will happen to you. You will be plundered. Right, that's in verse eight, because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to the cities and all who dwell in them. So the first woe is because they have taken what is not theirs. Now all the other nations will rise up and plunder them. The second woe, woe to him in verse nine, who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life, for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. So again, what has Babylon done? done? They thought that with all the wealth that they have accumulated, that no one would be able to touch them. All right, money was and is and will be always the thing that rivals God most for our hearts because it is the only thing that can falsely provide everything that God does, which is what? Security for your future, right? Safety, your, all the blessings and the things that you want in life, what is, all the things that you wait for, all the things that you desire, the, the, the eternal riches, right? Money promises all of these things, one of the main things money promises is security. And so when Babylon takes all of the wealth, they feel like they are untouchable. Nobody will now touch us because we have the best walls, we have the best army, we have everything that wealth can buy. We have security, the most important thing that wealth can buy. So what is God's judgment? He says, shame and death will come upon them. The earth cried out when Cain killed Abel, it says in scripture in Genesis. And the earth cried out against the injustice done to Abel. In James chapter five, verse four, it says, behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. Here, what does God say? It says, for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. I 
I love this because we see this all throughout scripture that the earth itself groans against injustice. And the very things that were witnessed to our injustice are the very things that will stand against us in trial. In James chapter five, for the rich, it is the oppression that you have caused, the wages of the laborers, literally the wages. It is an inanimate object being personified, which you kept back. Those wages will come stand trial against you. The earth that Abel's blood was spilt on cried out to the Lord and stood on the trial against Cain. And here it says that the houses that they built that they thought were so strong, so secure, so high up away from the enemy, those very houses that they built now will cry out against them. The judgment is that shame and death will come. You have devised shame for your house, it says in verse 10, by cutting off many people, and you have forfeited your life. God sees. You know, when we, especially when we think about money, when we see people with money, we are, we are obsessed as a society with money. We have the Forbes top, you know, 500. We have the, uh, the, the 500 companies. We have the 100 richest people. You can look up anybody, look at their net worth, how they got it. Every day I see in the news cycle because it's uh, uh, Musk and Bezos have been going back and forth for the richest man alive. And so every day we're, who's the richest man now? Who's the richest man now? And we think in all of that they have security. Only I had that. That's why Jesus says you, what, what is it worth if you gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? Because Babylon here forfeited its life, its soul. Right? This is not a new concept. It's not one that will ever get old. It is something that we have to always be with in front of our face. We will look at things and people, and nations, and we will look at the wealth and we will say, why have you blessed them? I want that. But the things that they have acquired unjustly will stand against them in trial. And whatever we do for fast money to acquire things unjustly, we may be able to live it up now, but one day that thing will prosecute us when we stand before God. Verse 12, the next woe. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. See, what Babylon did when they took all of that wealth, all of us learned about the very famous hanging gardens of Babylon. What do you think they did with all of that wealth? They took it and they built one of the ancient wonders of the world, something that thousands and thousands of years later we are still taught about in school because that is how famous it was, the city that they built, when the Chaldeans, which was the tribe that took over the Babylonian Empire, and that's why in Habakkuk they're called the Chaldeans, when they went and devastated everybody, they went back to the city of Babylon and they rebuilt it. And they rebuilt it to such a way that it became the fame of all of the world and now the fame of our history books, where we still talk about the beauty of it. But they built this city with the blood that they spilt on the battlefield. The blood they spilt conquering. And so God's judgment is, I think, a very harsh judgment here. Their labor was in vain. You know, if you think of any great women or men in history and you look at their life, there's an obsession that you see across all of history, and that is for longevity. There, there's some type of eternalness, whether in the Roman Empire, they would be lifted to godhood, and in their will, they would leave the money and the plans for a temple to be erected to them so that they can be worshipped by the people as a god. And the, the Roman uh, pantheon becomes now a, a, 
a, a list of gods of old Roman emperors, starting with Caesar and Augustus and Julius Caesar then before him, and then every emperor after that. Why? Because the, And then now we have the richest people on earth that are obsessed with going to space and, and living forever and every the, the greatest diet and how can I freeze my body or my DNA so that one day I can be brought. It's eternity is in our hearts. And this empire has conquered and spilled blood so that they can now build a city that will last forever. But what does God say? Their judgment is their labor was in vain. He says, behold, it is, not, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire and the nations weary themselves for nothing? But then I love this woe because we get something new here. We get a prophetic word for the future. The earth will be God's kingdom. Right, this is not just that every empire is going to fall. That's why I constantly tell people when you think of America, everybody always thinks the kingdom of God is associated with America. This is Christian evangelicalism in America that if, if America falls, Christendom falls with it. It is not true. Christian Christianity and America are not linked so that if one demises, the other demises. So if America falls, Christianity does not fall. Why? Every empire will fall. Babylon fell, Rome fell, America will fall. Every great empire will fall. Every great Chinese dynasty came to ruin. The Mongolian Empire, the greatest empire the world has ever seen in history, came to ruin. Every empire will fall. But there is a promise that there will be one who covers the earth. And his empire will be everlasting, and that is the empire that we are a part of. That is the empire that the remnant of God, the church, is a part of, that we were grafted into, is for the Jews then, but then the Gentiles, us, grafted into that plan so that through Jesus Christ, we can be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of the glorious Son, so that we, for eternity, will be in that empire, so that as Habakkuk prophesies here, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea, all the earth will worship before our God. And every nation that labors to empire itself and to build will fall and do it in vain. The fourth woe. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and other shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as, you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them. For the blood of man and violence to the earth to cities and all who dwell in them. This is, for me, a powerful image. And it's because there, there is a sense of wine and drunkenness here. We, all of the things that we read about in verses four and five from last week are now being woven into these taunts that God has towards Babylon. But the, the imagery that God takes is the, the cup of wine and drunkenness is in scripture is actually a picture of God's wrath. And so when, when Jesus is about to receive the wrath of God for all of us, he says, Lord, will you, Father, will you take this cup from me? Because the cup is the symbol of the wrath of God that when we drink of the cup, we are drinking of the wrath of God. So if you get a prophetic word that you are going to drink from the cup, run, 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 run. The wrath of God is coming upon you. And so this is powerful because what, what the Lord is saying here is that Babylon forced others to drink their cup to the point that they were drunk with the wrath of Babylon, that they overwhelmingly made them drink 
of the cup of wrath. If you read about how they would take their slaves and conquered peoples, whether they're uh, uh, non-slaves alike, they would actually hook all their mouths with fish hooks one after another and walk them in lines like fish from the sea to shame them as they walk them back to Babylon or displace them to another place of the empire. That what They would devastate cities. They would annihilate whole populations if they didn't like them. Why? They were making them drink their cup of wrath until they were drunk with it. The surface level, the understanding of this is also just the drunken debauchery that was Babylon and how they enticed other nations to be part of that drunken debauchery with them. The best example I can think of this is a mob boss, right? If you read any, if you watch any of the great mob uh, movies, the, the, the beautiful Italians and what they have done, um, what do you see? You see both sides of that, right? I think Sopranos is a good example of that. You see the debauchery, right? The strip clubs and the cheating and the adultery and to be part of that system, to be accepted, you have to walk into all of that. But then you also see the other, the cup of wrath that is handed out to all of the enemies, where it's not just about, say, killing your enemy or winning over your enemy. It's about making your enemy suffer, in the process. And so they forced others to drink their cup and their cup was full of war, was full of violence and full of humiliation. And so the judgment that is given to them by God is they will be forced to drink the cup of God's wrath. Just like Noah, this is imagery of Noah because Noah when he got drunk, it said that his son gazed upon his nakedness and, his hum- and, and he was, it was um, humiliating for Noah because he drank so much wine, he dropped his rose and he started dancing. Noah was having a good night. He was dancing, he was having a lot of fun, but the dude had a little too much and what happened, he was, he was dancing naked. And so, but when his son saw it, it was humiliating for him And his one son told the other two sons, and the other two sons went backwards and clothed their father so that they would not partake in the humiliation that he had. And so, just like Noah, God is saying here, when they are drunk, they will stand naked before all the nations. Unlike Noah, though, they will not be covered. Unlike Noah, they will stand in shame for everybody to see their uncircumcision. Everybody will gaze upon their humiliation. And the cup of God's wrath that is promised towards them is war, violence, and humiliation. And the last one, the last woe, doesn't start with a woe, and this is a signal that this is coming to a close. It says, what prophet is an idol? When its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake to a silent stone, arise, can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Their gods, their idols, they created with their own hands. We read about this in the book of Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar even made an own, his own image in a huge statue that everybody was supposed to bow down to. This was really them just actually worshiping themselves. They were worshiping self, the creator in them, rather the creator of them. God fashioned in their own image rather than them fashioned in God's image. And so what is the judgment for this? The judgment is this. The Lord sits in his throne in his temple. Right? If you look at all of where these idols stood, they, they stood in the temples and they would have these huge statues 
and they would go pray to these statues. They'd have the priestly uh, people that would keep watch over these statues. They, they would have the Vestal Virgins that would stay there and do the div- divinations and all these different things. And they would worship to these things created with their own hands. But they, the judgments from, would come from the temples, whether it would go to war or not. Like it was all held, the power of these idols. They would do it in front of these statues that were lifeless, could not talk back. And so this judgment is just this, that the Lord sits in his holy temple. There is a real temple that the Lord sits with, and we cannot contain him in a temple made by man. The heavens are his temple, are his dwelling place, and the earth is his footstool, the word says. Let all the earth keep silence before him. He's saying, you have fake judges, you have fake gods, you have fake carvings, but the real judge in the real temple is going to pronounce a real judgment over you. And what he says is going to be what happens. Their judgments will be that they will have to sit before the real judge of the earth. And the fear of the Lord will be upon them. Babylon felt untouchable at this time. Nobody could break them. Nobody was faster than them. What they were accomplishing seem to be one of the most incredible meteoric rises in history up until that moment for them. This empire would never fall. They also had one of the most meteoric falls from grace. Just 70 years they lasted before they came to nothing. I think today we may look at companies, we may look at people, and we think they are untouchable. We may look at the systems of our nation or of this world and think there is nothing that will ever change. It is too big to fail. We will look at the political system and we will have the same response that Habakkuk would have. Will it last forever, Lord? Well, Yahweh was in his holy temple. And he was sitting on the one and only true throne proclaiming judgment over Babylon and he sits there today proclaiming judgment for all the earth. Today he still sits on the throne. And what we have to remember about the justice of God is God will always have justice. Always. No one will get away with anything that they have done. No person individually, no group corporately. Everyone will fall under the judgment of God. And if people are not alive or around to stand against you, guess what? The very earth will stand against you. The very things that you have accumulated, the very things that we have done will stand against us. This should be a terrifying thing, and it is a terrifying thing. And that is why when we think of Jesus, we always stay in a posture of gratefulness and thankfulness. Because the reason Jesus had to die the way that he did on a cross, bloodied, beaten, crucified, was because God had to have justice for our sins. Our sins needed to be rectified somewhere. And if we were going to stand before the throne, righteous, sinless, and in the presence of almighty, holy God, something needed to have happened to justify the reason why we were standing there. And the only reason why we can stand in the Holy of Holies and celebrate the goodness of God today is because justice was had on that cross. 
And so everyone who believes on the name of Jesus is washed by his blood, covered in his righteousness, and adopted as heirs into his kingdom. And we can rightfully stand before God knowing that our sins are as far as the east is from the west. Never to be remembered, always forgotten. Because God does not need double justice for something that was already paid. But every nation and every person and every group that does not stand under the blood of Jesus will stand for their own sins and injustice. And on that day, they will drink of the cup of wrath. And we will praise God because he is incredibly gracious, incredibly holy. And we thank him that he has made a way so that all of us can be under his grace and that anybody who believes in his name can be under it as well. But everyone who rejects the name of Christ will stand to drink of the cup of wrath that was meant for them in Jesus. But now they must take themselves. Can you stand with me and pray? Father, I thank you that nothing escapes your eyes. That you see all, you hear all, you are around all. That we would not presume on the kindness of God, as it says in Romans. But that we would remember your justice. Lord, that when we look around us disillusioned by the world and wondering where you are, that we would remember that you see, hear all, and that you sit on the throne in your holy temple, that no one has dethroned you and you have not gone anywhere, but you are still making judgments today as you were then. And that we would run to your son, who is our only hope for salvation, our only hope unto righteousness. Our only hope to stand before you justified, forgiven and washed and cleansed. Our only hope to live renewed in eternity with you. Let us remember you today your holiness and your power as we worship. In Jesus' name we pray. If anybody would like prayer while we worship, at any moment we'll have some of our prayer leaders on the side. You can come and receive prayer.
Name. 
There's no one like Jesus. There's no one like Jesus. There's no one like Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. You silence the boast. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign for your the name like yours, Jesus. You are worthy of all honor, all thankfulness, all praise that we can give you. Lord, and I pray our thankfulness would not stop with the service ending, but Lord, that we would thank you in our homes, that we would thank you in our workplaces, that we would thank you on the train and in our cars with our kids and with our friends. God, that we would live a life thankful that you took the cup on our behalf. And because of it, we stand today righteous before you, able to enjoy your spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
There is no other name like Jesus. And in his name we pray and we all say amen, amen. Can we give God praise one more time? Y'all may be seated. I'm just going to hand it over. We're running a little bit late today, but that's okay. I didn't want to stop that worship. It was good. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Winnie, our MC, who's going to close us out for today. Thank you, Justin. All right. So we have our normal four announcements uh, before we close. And just wanted to ask, who is here for the first time? Um, Welcome, welcome. And we have uh, Justin given a huge holler, but let's just give a round of applause. I love being able to, anybody that's coming out on Marathon Sunday, I mean, come on. Um, we would love to connect with you in our back, in our connect table. Uh, we would love to connect and also give you a special gift, which is a t-shirt. So I'm just gonna let you know right off the bat that that's what we got. Um, and just to let you know what's going on in our community today. Next announcement is this, we are a community that doesn't just gather on Sundays, but we really believe that we get to be part of each other's lives, nosy about each other's lives every single day of the week. Um, and the best way to know what's going on is actually through our app at www.zion.nyc join. And if you go on there, it's super simple to get connected. Just wanna highlight four things that are going on even in our app. First is that our anger class that uh, Justin had mentioned in the beginning, um, it's, it's a class that has started, but you can still join. There are three more weeks. Um, and the learning that was happening in that first week, I am super excited about what the next weeks will entail. So you can look up all the details are in that space. Next is our Bible studies are roaring on, continuing on, and we have them on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, all in different locations. You can find out more information there. We're in First Peter and still riding along. I believe we're in week four, three or four right now. Um, and Another one is a women's prayer in Brooklyn and Staten Island. Please register on the app uh, so that you can get connected, know where the details are and how to get plugged in um, and to join in in prayer. And last is our Thanksgiving potluck. This is also super exciting in the same way that Z Kids, this was our first week that we had Z Kids. Um, in two years, we haven't had a Thanksgiving potluck. Um, and for us to be able to join in, if you would love to, uh, contribute a dish in any way. There are tins in the back that you can find and um, and put your dish in. So there are different ways to serve in that Thanksgiving potluck and you can find out all that information uh, in our app. Uh, our next announcement is about giving, which is if you consider Zion your home and would love to invest in what is going on in this spot, in this place, um, you can text 84321, your dollar amount, and it's a seamless setup from there. Or you can go on our website, click on the Donate tab, and that is also a seamless setup from there. And our last announcement is about serving. So here at Zion, we consider our weekly service, our weekly Sunday service, like a family gathering. So we can show our love to one another by loving God and loving our neighbors by serving. Um, like any healthy family, everybody's got a role, everybody got different responsibilities, and you have a place here. Uh, the best way to know what are some of the needs and where are places that you can get plugged in, I'll point you to the back. If you look for Sarah, she would love to connect with you today and just to share a little bit about how you can serve. Those are all my announcements. I am done talking. <laughs> um, but our benediction is something that we can bless, not just from me to you, but from you to me as well. So if you would stand with me, we're going to be uh, speaking John 14, 27. And you can read it in your sheet. And it says this, and you can join with me as we read this together. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And all God's people can say, amen. <laughs>